So, Bud, we're out here today at SC Village for Decay of Nations 2018, and we have you looking at the paintballhistory.com display, and I'm going to just ask you a couple questions about various markers. Is that all right? Great being here. Yes. Awesome. So, first up, we have Autococking Sniper Serial Number 2, mm -hmm. and this is the second sniper body? The second sniper body that we made, that, you know, because of the welded body on, mm -hmm. and it's actually the third. The but third. It's not, it's, I made two more guns, one for my son, left-handed, and then one number one, mm -hmm. which is kind of an oddball, but it's it based off of this. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the welded tubes, that's the main thing. We uh -huh. made those in my shop at home. Gotcha, so, gotcha. And that was, that's what people def or mostly define as like a garage gun. Yeah. Is a sniper body that has a welded in feed too. That's it. And that would be about the first like 300, 300. 350. Yeah, somewhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, um, if I recall, you might, you know more about it than I do sometimes, but it could be 500. Could be up to 500. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I made him in, in my garage for about a year and a half. Uh huh. And uh, another thing on those is, were you machining those bodies by hand versus by hand. versus extrusion, oh, which yeah. would be after 500? Uh, after 500, I think it was right right in there. We started getting an extruded body. Okay, so that's a, and then a, we went to the extruded body with. Um, um, Sight rail on for the so, sniper yeah. too, but that's another big defining factor of the garage gun versus the non garage yes. gun is yeah. hand milled versus or yeah. you know yeah, manual machining versus one at a extrusion. Time. Gotcha. Billet, billet. billet yeah. extrusion. Billet one at a time. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, another thing that I thought was interesting was your choice to convert maybe the first um, serialized body into a uh, semi-automatic and make, make it actually an auto cocking sniper. What was your uh, thought process behind that? Well, I, m I made a cocking system so it would convert, so you could buy one gun and have a semi-automatic or a pump, mm -hmm. you know? So I want to make sure that it fit on all my previous manufactured uh, gotcha. guns. So, and uh, I put it on number two, I yeah. had it set in there. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting choice by actually taking essentially the earliest, um, standardized body and showing see even the earliest standardized body can yeah. be converted into a semi-automatic the only one that would not fit on with number one yeah or or the other possibly yeah. the other uh, yeah. body for your side the first two are fixed barrels fixed they're, barrel. they're screw in. yeah and that's what you have pictured in the ad in apg yes. right or not yes. ad sorry the article the article article of apg where it shows your prototype and it has you posing with it yes. and that's, that's uh, 87 one. late 87. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we talked about earlier is that these very early bodies would be um, probably six months prior to that, maybe even the beginning of 87. Yeah. And the defining factor you mentioned was that when the headhunters moved from SC Village to War Zone, it was two months prior or two months after? Well, uh, about two months after. Two months after is yeah. when you actually... I think it was kind of in November, you know, October, November area. Of 86 then. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's when you really started the project. And you said you built your first autococker or your first sniper body in, you know, you or the whole gun in eight hours. In eight, yeah. You took a Sheridan. Well, I thought about it for um, a week. And yeah. then um, my favorite program is going to be on TV at eight o'clock. So uh -huh. I started building it at six. And by by eight o'clock, I had the trigger frame on a, on a uh -huh. piece of aluminum. Uh -huh. You know, so I went back out after my program was over and, and I worked on it till about midnight, got yeah. up at six and uh, finished it off and I shot it at uh, nine o'clock the next morning. Huh. That's and awesome. then I went and shot Stan Russell in the ass. Yeah, can you, do you want to go into that story right <laughs> no, now? No, no, no. That's, that's a story a, for another day. That, the, that's the, the too long a story. The Annihilator Marauder versus the Sniper. Yeah. Yeah, starring Stan. Stan Stan's Stan, a great guy. I love uh, him. Uh, Gunner and uh, yourself. Gunner, Gunner with a big yeah, yeah, that's another day. That's okay, yes, yeah, so moving on, we have down here the AGS rifle. And yeah. you actually remember seeing the AGS rifle here at SC Village? Yeah. First time I seen it, um, what's the guy's name? Um, Matt Brown Matt at AGS. Brown. 
brought it here. And you're sure it wasn't Matt Brown? It wasn't David Craig? No, it was Matt Brown. Matt Brown. They never came out here a whole lot. Oh, okay. Matt did. Matt did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I uh, seen Matt a lot more than I did David. Yeah. And uh, he brought this out there, and I actually got a chance to shoot it. Yeah. And uh, this is actually the gun that got me interested in making an auto pocket yeah. system. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, uh, I mean, it was such a revolution over a pump action. Yeah. Had you seen a semi-automatic prior to this gun? No, no. No. You had probably seen attempts, but maybe you never saw something that actually... Oh, I've seen a lot of attempts. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Do you want to mention anybody who was working on a, a semi-automatic prior to the time you saw this gun? Were there any local Southern California people there, that... There were a couple of people. I couldn't remember their names. Just know. like guys who came out. you get out. my age, you don't remember names. Yeah. And maybe they that's all they had to maybe they just had one project that they made yeah it was just like an attempt you yeah know, yeah you know, and stuff like that awesome awesome i mean it's um but this is this is the actual first one the reason i got in you know, the pneumatic system i wasn't uh, i was very familiar with pneumatic systems yeah. i worked for the shipyard and yeah and also was in racing and i used uh -huh. some of the pneumatic system on on uh, throttle stops and stuff yeah. like that so yeah I, it wasn't new to me, but yeah. putting it all together. I mean, be. there's so many variations when it comes to pneumatics and, you know, seeing a system that is pretty close to working, like maybe this had some components that weren't really optimized, like this giant regulator on the side and maybe the spring in the switch and, you know, this huge ram coming out the back. It's, it's not the perfect system, but it really is close to what would become, you know, the, the more popularized system yes. today. Or, exactly. you know, throughout the 90s. So a lot it's, of the switches, you know, the three ways or four ways actually, um, you know, it, it's, I was familiar with some of those too. Yeah. And the rams, you know, we use clippered rams instead yeah. of these. You know, there was a lot of stuff out there in the marketplace, but the, the ones that I use, I was familiar with. Uh huh. You know, yeah, you get to know the pneumatics that yeah. you're using, and then you don't, you know, you like someone else could have a pneumatic component that's completely like blows your mind. You're like, wow, where did you get that? Yeah. I was just talking to a gentleman about the, the trigger uh -huh. and angles, you know, yeah. of that from yeah. the sear to the trigger angle to make it right. It took me probably two weeks of making a lot of triggers yeah. to get that angle just the, right. The, where it actually engages the sear. It engages the sear and it's not too hard to pull or, mm. you know, I yeah, mean, that I was get, a big thing. I guess the pin placement, the spring placement, the angle of the yeah. sear, the angle of the trigger plate, those things all play a factor. All in that. of it. Yeah. yeah. That was the hardest part of making it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, people don't really realize like you need, you really have to think all those angles through. Well, the first one actually was I used a stock trigger, and off of the sear, I used a ram, uh, yeah, a, just, pin, uh, a pin that went into the top of the three-way, yeah, and that pushed it. And back then, the three-way was actually uh, it was uh, spring return, uh huh, just and like so, on this, just yeah. like on the AGS yeah. rifle right here. You can see yeah. we press down, and then as we pull up, the uh, the, the switch comes automatically yeah. comes back up to you, yeah. And then that's what I first run in here, but it was just. It would take forever to make one. Yeah. You know, so that's when I started moving them to the front. You mentioned that the when you were fitting the switches in the frame, that was around the time you were working with Jamil, right? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, that's, I, that was I, Jamil's thing is fitting the switches in there. Yeah. But then, you know, when I started doing that, I, I, I actually, it was too cumbersome and too big to put in the frame. Yeah. So I cut it to yeah. a square, yeah. cut it down enough to where it fit in here. Gotcha. And yeah. then uh, I still have that, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's something Frame I want to everything. see. Okay, so let's move over here now. And you were, is this something you want to talk about right now? Well, is yeah, this is a barrel plug. And everybody, now back in the day, when the, there was basically three size barrels. Uh-huh. You know, and... Um, Which were 50, 62, 68. No, the, it's different diameter. Oh, uh, okay, and, so and you have RPS, IDs. Nelson, yeah. and... and all of and there was within, you know, three or four thousand to each other, but yeah. it wasn't, wasn't all six, eight, nine. Yeah. You know, yeah. six, eight, seven, six, eight, uh, uh -huh. six, eight, nine, and six, nine, oh, one, or six, nine, one. Yeah. And the reason I made to start it off, Dennis come to me. My wife was one of the gunsmiths here. Yeah. You know, and she rented the guns out while uh -huh. I was out playing. Yeah. And uh, people would come in and slam the gun down on the counter, and, and uh, she's a blonde little girl. She and the balls would just miss her and hit the yeah. walls. As a matter yeah. of fact, they're still on the walls. They used to be. Uh huh. And uh, so Dennis came to me, 
and said, you know, we got to do something about this because she's going to get hit in the face. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah. So I went home and, and I done a lot of calculating and I come up with the three different, that's the three different O-rings or three different barrel sizes. Yeah. Now, if you didn't stick nothing in this hole, okay, and you had a 12 inch barrel and you put this barrel plug in it, no matter whether it re reached all the O-rings or just one, the hole was big enough to where if you're shooting 300 feet per second, that it would restrict the air enough to slow the ball down so it never hit the end of it. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't blow up in the barrel. Yeah, cool. yeah know? that is cool. And that's that, but then that people, not very many people know. Yeah, people started putting strings in them and stuff like that, and then yeah. they started, yeah. you know. And, uh, yeah, that's one thing that Gio was actually telling me yesterday is that you know if you restrict either the size or you, you close that inner diameter hole off completely, you know, It'd blow out. Yeah, it'd blow out, and people just completely miss that point. But yeah. I should have made a, another, some way of attaching hey, a string yeah. to it. Yeah. Once again, back then, everybody loved each other, and we grew the industry because <laughs> that was was free to everybody to use. Yeah. And then you had scumbags start patenting shit. Give them how you started the ASTM and, and saved our whole industry. Please give them that history. Because you're the only one who put money up, who did it, Actually, invited everybody, see. and everybody was nobody was excluded. Now we're, we're an industry of exclusion. Well, yeah, no, nobody was excluded. Nobody, right, you let everybody well, in. Well, I had 200 people in there. <laughs> and, you know, and then you get 200 people, all different opinions, and then ASTM turned into a brawl, you know. Yeah, but you managed it well. It's a verbal well. brawl. You managed it well. Yeah, but I just said that no, to no, you. One thing I love about ASTM, we have the lifetime of John Gregory, when he called Jerry uh, Brookshire Buckwheat. Oh, and <laughs> yes, yes, yes. In fact, I just talked to John yesterday. I talked to Buckwheat too. Oh no! I, uh. See, this is the beautiful thing about the whole thing. This guy was a son. Everybody wanted information. Everybody wanted to share. They all went to Bud because he was never about me. He was he was the center point of the solar system of paintball. One hundred percent. He was about everybody. He took everybody's opinion if you were wrong he never made you feel bad mm -hmm. he would say this is why we're going this direction yeah yeah and i love that about him because yeah. i was a, back then i was very stubborn and he would sit me down jill this is why we're doing this uh-huh but we lost that he so, kept a and he calm kept, cool and composed he kept everybody talking and then when there's a change because we saw a lot of changes here fast there's a lot of players yeah he was on it yeah and the world went around the world hey we got to change this hmm. from the gun plug even even us at Google. How many referees we should have, and, yeah. and how we should operate games. And it was just so great. And he was—he was a real businessman. Most back then, everybody in paintball were a hobbyist, mm -hmm. but he was already machine shop. So he had that machine shop and like like forward way of thinking. Yeah. How do we mass produce this? Yeah. How, how do you scale this in a proper fashion? Yeah. How do you how do you produce this while you know maintaining it the feasibility yeah. of it? It's a shame. Yeah. But we he still comes with us, but it's a shame we lost that that mind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, 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 go ahead, but I'm I'll, out again. I was okay. surprised they don't have ASTM a lot of meetings anymore. No. You were the cat of you got everybody to go. And and then it became how do I advance my technology? It wasn't like you. We'd have good debates, we'd flush it out, never an argument. Well, no, I, yeah, yeah. You're right, because I had to change my way a lot. A lot of times yeah, but to meet yeah. the right way to but work with these honest. people that were coming at you with, from a completely different direction. Yeah. Oh. oh. He, he would came with I, like even ball breaking. He came with like you remember you came with that little triangle thing, yeah. how to scale things. You know, like the trigger pull. Everybody was like, we're doing like and you no know, engineers. Mm -hmm. No, this is how we do this. Yeah. Back then, no one ever talked feet per second. He was the first guy to bring jewel weight. Oh, and then yeah. even the eye guys went with jewel weight on uh -huh. um, balls breaking yeah. the, the eye. Yeah. And he was part of that too. He was uh -huh. part of, hey, how do we save the eye? How do we, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's not a doctor, but and, he did. And that's a perfect lead into into uh, this video that we're going to do. These didn't come with um, zip ties. <laughs> with the zip tie in the top. No. That's aftermarket. That's this, a... this was a little project that Russell Maynard and, and myself took upon ourselves with a company, and I don't remember the name of it, it's back in Chicago. We wanted to make a mass. Uh -huh. And this is really kind of one of the first ones. Tom came out with something similar, yeah. which turned us on to this thing. Uh -huh. Try and protect your chin, your neck, your yeah, ears, yeah. and Tom's, stuff like that. Tom's mass is significantly earlier though. What year do you think this one is? Yeah, it's probably a couple of years. 
Yeah, Tom's is about 86, I think, right? 85, yeah, 86? Um, 86, 87. 86, 87, so yeah. this is probably uh, 80, 88, 89? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, was this called the Gogs, or was it called the Pursuit you know, I, don't, I think that I think that's what they ended up calling it. Yeah. But this was a, this was a bear, making these lenses. Uh-huh. I mean, we worked on these lenses, and uh, neither one of us were you know real smart and plastics yeah but this man this when you say neither is, one of us you mean yourself and a russell what myself and russell man yeah. yeah russell was a great guy i mean uh -huh. he helped me make the ammo box yeah yeah you know? i mean we spent hours making the ammo box uh-huh but this thing here we made it flat and every time you put it flat and you could smear paintball goo on it and uh fill and um sit back and come in the next morning it, it would be split open it would, be what? It, would be, it would be broken by itself. Oh, the plastic would. Yeah. The, the and gel. So we got into researching the pla different plastics and come to find out any time that you may manufacture something plastic flat and then you bend it, it's going to have hairline cracks. Now you can take this lens. We took the lens, started holding up the light sideways so you're looking this way and you could see it look like rainbows in it. Oh. So it was all just my cracks. Yeah. And once hundreds, it cracked, you get the fill in it and then it split it open. Huh. So these had to be manufactured on a curve. Oh. So they, they were That's a It's a genius a idea, manufacturing a mask that you could just wrap in something. Yeah. Because the lenses take up so much space and putting them in, in uh, you know, with all the different little you know, tabs and everything can be such so like cumbersome. But when you actually manufacture it flat and you roll it to fit on the mask, it's just genius. It's too bad that that was never an idea that could really take off because of it. Well, we, we spent like three months. Yeah. You know, I spent like 40 grand yeah. going back and forth to Chicago with Russell and myself and just the time that we spent. Yeah. Trying to was uh, Direct Connect involved in this at all? Uh, Direct Connect got involved in it. Oh. When it come down to the time, we was working with a company, uh, manufacturing company in Chicago area. Yeah. And it come down to this right here that yeah. little eyebrow we 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 done a lot of shooting of this mask uh -huh. whether it's on us and off of it but you'd hit it right here and the, and the, the ball oh. would go inside the thing yeah so we had to put this on huh. well the manufacturer got kind of aggravated with us because we made these little minute changes to yeah. it which is pretty significant yeah and um so then up pat up came pmi and um they, they bought it out from underneath me. So I lost all my money and then they started doing it. And there's two things. They put the eyebrow in, but they didn't put the chin straps. Oh. Okay. And I said, you got to put the chin strap because these things get hot and the first thing people want to do is raise them up. Uh -huh. And they said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. So PMI got it and within the first month they were sued because the police department was using them and one of the cops raised it up, got shot in the eye and lost his huh. eye. Huh. So then they scurried back and put this in. So one of the first implementations of the chin strap as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we tried to force it, but then the manufacturer, and I can't remember who the heck it was. Hmm. I had to go back and look. Yeah, this is also interesting that you point out the ridge right there because it makes so much sense that, you know, if you were to get shot from this angle, you know, it'd oh, go right under the lens. You know, on, a, for instance, a JT mask, the lens is going to be embedded inside of, right. inside of inside. plastic, so you're not yeah. going to have that problem. But when the lens is on the outside, you have to have something to block that. Yeah, I have it to block it. So yeah. we done that and, you know, we just moved on. You know, yeah. I mean, things happen and yeah. it's the way it is. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but they was, this is one of the first ones I got actually... I got probably a dozen of them at home. I gave this one to you. Yeah, that's that's from you. Looks like I might need to give you a new lens. <laughs> I think it's a that crack. I think that when you gave me this, it had a, a plastic uh, it cover did. on it. it yeah, did a, few, a little while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they, it's real. Yeah, I would wear it today. Yeah, you made variations, in, or they made variations in color on these as well, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've seen green, and I've also seen ads where they're yellow. I red. Think. Yeah. Yellow, red, yeah. Uh, green, yeah. black, yeah. white. Anything, yeah. some white ones. Huh. Huh. So but, um, we have, they were really neat. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, they come with the foam inside. So first mm -hmm. on this, like in terms of paintball, we have probably first with a chin strap, first with some uh, method of, you know, on shield uh, protection from paint going under the lens. Yeah. We also have maybe this is the first with the top cover Helmet. because Tom's yeah. didn't have a top cover. 
uh, most everything with goggles. Yeah. And then they're with the, yeah. the chin guards. And yeah. Uh, not much ear protection. And then first with probably quick release as well. Yeah. You know, oh, it's, yeah. its yes, own it's lens good. with the actual quick, quick release method. Yeah. Yeah, really uh, fascinating. And then back, well, this is, you know, obviously everything has back straps, but this has actual clips. Yeah. And is that so you can clip this onto here? Well, these, I'm not sure what, there was something went around here. Oh. I don't remember what it was. Maybe some kind of back head protection system yeah. thing? Yeah. Maybe you were pr prototyping that. Well, and we were ground. prototyping a, a, a skirt to go around it. Oh, the gotcha. Back of gotcha. Yeah. yeah, it's a good idea. People, aftermarket manufacturers could make a product that could clip on there. If yeah. this mask was successful, it would be easier for people to implement that. This is like a standardized button type thing. Yeah. Oh, you know what, actually? It's just so you can unclip it and keep no, it clipped. Oh, we can to unclip the other. this, yeah. Well, you to be able to. I don't know oh, no, why. this unclips. And yeah. this can clip. Anyway, well, maybe maybe <laughs> keep it clipped to the other side. I don't know, but pretty cool. Oh, we had we just coming up with all kind of ideas. That's the reason the guy that wanted to manufacture them was getting all aggravated with it. Uh huh. Because we were trying to Constant upgrade changes. Constant changes. And production. as you go, you're going to upgrade. Yeah, stuff. for sure. Because you get shot in the face, you're going to figure out that what yeah. you got to do this. As you're and testing your prototype, yeah. you you have to Im implement the changes that you've made. Yeah. Um, both of us, Russell and I, both ate a lot of paint from this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, this also leads into one other thing that maybe we'll talk about for just a moment is, you know, you're, you would meet with Russell, you would meet with Tom Kay, and you guys would just brainstorm for hours. Oh, we'd meet with Russell, Tom Kay, uh, Mike Cassidy. Ross Alexander. Ross Alexander. And we'd meet in a room when we go to uh, Deborah's tournament uh -huh. in uh, Pennsylvania. And we would sit there, it's had about three or four years. Yeah. And there's a lot of good things come out of them meetings. Yeah. It wasn't a meeting, it's just a brainstorm thing. Yeah, brainstorming session. We had session. a few toddies and then sit back and yeah. and talk about things that we were brainstorming. Uh -huh. That was back when most of the manufacturers would get together and just have a ball. And if somebody needed help, if Tom needed help, mm -hmm. he'd call me, I'd give him help. Yeah. If I needed help, I'd call Tom, because yeah. Tom was a, a genius, uh -huh. you know, design guy. Yeah, so. yeah. And um, that's where the automag come from. Yeah, you were mentioning you know? the blow forward, the idea of yeah. blow forward implementation inside uh -huh. of a paintball yeah. marker valve. I think Mike Cathy came through with the, the voice activated feed. Yeah, is that feeder? something you guys talked about also? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we talked that, and he went back and done that. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff that we come up with. Yeah. It was just, it's almost like a dare to see if you could actually implement some of these things. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Most of it we did yeah. at some point or another. Yeah. You know, You're when like we started, it didn't have constant air. So we were talking about the six pack. Uh huh. You know, I had yeah. a pump change. He had a six pack. Yeah. You um, had your pump changer. You also had your Q changer, right? Yeah. 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 And I even had a, I had a, it held six uh, CO2s too, you know, 12 grams. And, um, I, you know, I had my hands full with the uh, ammo box and yeah. some other stuff I was doing. So yeah. I said, Tom, do it. Mm -hmm. Let's get it done, you know. Yeah. These are things that the industry needed at the time. Yeah. And it wasn't shameful to sit back and help, you know, each other yeah. do something. Yeah, I mean, you well, you guys could see firsthand that if there wasn't some way of getting CO2 into, or getting a constant you know, CO2 system uh, allowed in tournaments, then there, there would really be no further development of guns. You know, you couldn't go with a semi-automatic without more, m like a more constant feed of air, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, matter of fact, Jamel. Yeah. You know, he, uh, you wouldn't believe some of the, the regulators that him and I come up with. Yeah. I mean, yeah. One of them was actually three-eighths in uh, uh, octagon and, yeah. and it worked. Yeah, I think I remember it him off, mentioning worked that. worked off a Schrader valve. Yeah. You know, but I mean, the little teeny pits in it. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. You know, but uh, it, it wouldn't, because it was CO2, it would flow to, it freeze up. So yeah. It would make sure. things bigger. Nobody had HPA then. No. Well, what do you think? Is that it? Is that it for today, bud? That's it for today, but um, hopefully we get more done. I hope so too. I mean, awesome. I, I enjoy it. And yeah. Hopefully everybody out there enjoys it yeah i think they will so, hopefully our mics are working yeah there you go <laughs> cool all right thanks bud. take care man yeah be awesome. good bye everybody <laughs>